Good afternoon. Thank you for joining ABG and Mechanical Ventilation, a really exciting perspective in terms of how we look at our patients and how we make good decisions about what we're going to do with mechanical ventilation, how we're going to utilize our blood gas to help make decisions, and how we follow up on any changes that we might make with mechanical ventilation. So, Hopefully everyone can see my screen. And of course, you're always welcome to unmute. Let me know if there's a problem or chat in the chat box. Again, thank you for joining. I appreciate it so much. So for today, this isn't everything you ever needed to know, but for today, we're gonna to talk about three of the major issues in ventilatory support. The three big questions we should always be asking when we come to the bedside of a patient who's been diagnosed with respiratory failure, who is on non-invasive uh, ventilation or invasive ventilation, our first question is always, is our patient appropriately oxygenated? Second question is, is the patient removing CO2? And third, and really, really important, and we really have to think about it particularly, is are the alveoli recruited? Now, part of alveoli recruitment is also looking at lung compliance, which we won't have time for today, but which we will cover next week. And we'll also cover the metabolic therapeutic interventions uh, when we have patients who have metabolic acidosis or metabolic alkalosis, what we ought to use that information for and how we should compensate for it and treat it. So if you're just looking at this simple screen, you certainly are going to see that this is a basic ventilatory screen. This is a PB840, Puritan Bennett 840. Might be different than what you're used to, might be different than what you use in your institution. But conceptually, ventilation, no matter what, Conceptually, ventilation is always the same. That is, you choose your mode, your target, your pressure support, if you are doing SIMV or spontaneous breathing, your FiO2, and your PEEP. And everything that you're applying to your patient will appear somewhere and in a uh, patient display record for us on the Puritan Ben 840, that is across the top. Each breath that patient is taking, or the breath, the current breath, is a controlled breath. That means the ventilator gave the breath. Whether or not the patient requested it, the ventilator gave a breath. That's the controlled breath. Then next to that is the peak airway pressure, the mean airway pressure, which is incredibly important to us, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. PEEP, how long you spend out of your cycle, percent-wise or, or fraction-wise, how long you spend in your cycle breathing in and how long you spend in your cycle breathing out. And this is so incredibly important. It's called the I to E ratio, and it really uh, reflects how much time you're spending actually utilizing that exhalatory capacity to get rid of CO2. Next to that is the exhale tidal volume. And that's a little bit different than what you dial. The exhale tidal volume is actually, of course, what the patient is exhaling. And finally, on the top is V with a subset with a dot over the V and a subset E total. This is minute ventilation. So all of these criteria that we're looking at on our ventilator, we're really going to talk about in generic sense. This is not a ventilation class, so I'm not really gonna talk about mode and target and methodology. What I'm really gonna talk about are aspects of the ventilator that affect oxygenation, CO2 removal, and ultimately alveolar recruitment, which really has a lot to do with what we call static compliance. Okay, so when we think about, we're coming to the bedside, we're hearing about a patient's blood gas, we're evaluating the patient, we're really going to divide into two basic categories that are about the ventilator. So remember, I'm not really talking about metabolics here. That's a separate category. I'm not really going to cover much about that today. What I really want to cover is oxygenation and ventilation. So when we think about oxygenation, really important for all of us to strategize, to understand, to report, and to communicate. We talk about oxygenation, a patient who is intubated, talking about PaO2 and SaO2 is not good enough. You always have to think about the PaO2 as the oxygen dissolved in the blood and in direct relationship to the FiO2, 
which is the oxygen that you are uh, administering the patient via the ventilator and the ET tube. So P2F, we'll talk a lot more about this, is a methodology that says, did the gas I give the patient actually reach the blood? And the only way that it can reach the blood is if it gets past the conducting airways into the alveoli and the alveoli are completely surrounded by perfused capillaries. That's a lot to get your head around. The gas given from the ventilator must overcome the ET tube, the conducting airways reach the alveoli and the alveoli must be surrounded by well-perfused capillaries for oxygenation to take place. Now, when we talk about this as simply as possible, we just say gas in the blood divided by gas I gave you from the ventilator. That is known as the P to F, the P to F ratio, PaO2 to FiO2, just depends on who's talking in your rounds and their familiarity. Now, in order, as I've mentioned, for this to be acceptable, you must have an open lung, that means your alveoli are open, they're recruited. You must have clear airways. You must have open alveoli and you must have blood flow passed. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to appropriately oxygenate the blood. So yes, of course, we're all very interested in SAO2 and PaO2, but it is really important to remember that your patient's oxygenation and what their oxygenation tells you is based on what kind of effort you're putting forward to oxygenate them. So if you're using simple 21% or 30% FiO2, PEEP of five or less, that's not an extraordinary effort. If you're using an FiO2 of 80% and a PEEP of 12, that's an extraordinary effort. Now, I may, I may be turning somersaults because my patient's PO2 is finally 100. And I'm glad for that. But you have to always consider what is the effort you are putting forward to improve your patient's oxygenation. So I like to divide oxygenation into two categories, responder and refractory. And we're going to talk more about that when we look at a couple of case studies. So the very first thing that affects SAO2 and PaO2, obviously, is the fraction of atmospheric pressure that is oxygenated. That's what we talk about, FiO2, the fraction of atmospheric pressure that is oxygenated. Really important to remember that atmospheric pressure here where we live in Georgia is around 748 millimeters of mercury. So if I'm giving you 100% atmospheric pressure oxygen, that's 1.00 times 748. That means I'm delivering 748 millimeters mercury of oxygen into your alveoli. Now, if that oxygen went past the ET tube, the conducting airways and reached the alveoli and you have blood flow, appropriate blood flow past that alveoli, your PO2 should be roughly half of that partial pressure. So that means you're on 100% FiO2 in my head. I said 1.00 times 748, 748 millimeters mercury oxygen being pushed down into that lung, into the alveolus. I expect you patient to have a PO2 that's roughly half of that. So somewhere around 370. Oh, you're not, you're at 80, you're at 90, you're at 100. The very first thing I'm gonna say is, Maybe that oxygen never reached the alveolus, or maybe you don't have blood flow passed. I can't just stand around at the bedside congratulating myself that my patient's PO2 is finally 90 at 100% FiO2. So I would tell you that that patient, so the patient who has a PO2 of 370 with 100% FiO2, that patient is oxygen responsive. The patient who has a PO2 of 100, when you're giving 100% FiO2, that patient is refractory to oxygen. What that means is that we're going to push hard for other decisions for the patient. We're going to push hard to increase the mean airway pressure. And that's the pressure that is applied in the lung surface 
keeping your alveoli open. That's your mean airway pressure strategy. So for the majority of us, I'm sorry, I've left one off here. So I'm just going to add it now verbally. For the majority of us, that first step is to increase PEEP, to try to improve the mean airway pressure, to open up the lung, to open the alveoli so the gas I'm giving actually gets to the alveoli. Pretty straightforward. The second form that the majority of us use is pressure control inverse ratio, meaning you're spending more time in inspiration than you are in exhalation, and that allows you more time to open up the lung. Two other ways, APRV, airway pressure release ventilation, and HFOV, high frequency oscillation or jet ventilation, you have a lot of different varieties of this. They're, they're all mean airway pressure strategies. So I am in communication with my physician. I'm not dictating what strategy they use. What I say is this patient is refractory to oxygen. Can we apply or can we discuss a mean airway pressure strategy? Let's invite our respiratory therapy colleagues and let's talk about a mean airway pressure strategy. Sometimes it's going up on PEEP, sometimes it's pressure control inverse ratio, and sometimes if you have a really excellent respiratory therapy department and you have physicians who actually believe that airway pressure release ventilation is a good strategy to apply when trying to open the lung, that you're going to make those choices not by yourself as a bedside nurse, you're not changing the ventilator, but you're having good, very scientific discussions with your colleagues that your patient is refractory to oxygen, and now we've got to move to a mean airway pressure strategy. For ventilation, ventilation is really so much more simple. There are three basic components of ventilation. How much volume you exhale, how much time you spend in exhalation, and what is the blood flow past your alveoli? Okay, so remember for today, I'm not really going to talk about perfusion and metabolics, but I am going to talk about that next week. So hopefully you'll return. Today, I want to talk about your exhalation and your time for exhalation. So exhalation is basically uh, when we're talking about mechanical ventilation, we evaluate, that, evaluate this with tidal volume times respiratory rate. And the tidal volume that the ventilator is evaluating is the exhaled tidal volume. That exhaled tidal volume tells me about alveolar recoil and forced expulsion of gas. And I'm going to call that dirty gas. Dirty gas is oxygen poor and CO2 rich. And so you must exhale that, that's the exhale tidal volume, times the frequency or the respiratory rate, and that gives you minute ventilation. So really, really important uh, in terms of looking at patient's exhalation of CO2. But again, I want to remind you that if there is not blood flow past the alveolus, if you are not well perfused in the lung vascular bed, you will not be able to remove CO2. So even though we're talking about ventilation, it's always ventilation plus perfusion. That's an incredibly important component when we're talking about methodology. So if you've ever heard me speak anytime on any ventilator, on end tidal CO2, on anything to do with the alveolus, ARDS, sepsis, I always remind you that oxygenation evaluation is the simplest. It's the easiest thing we evaluate, not the easiest thing we treat. It's the easiest thing we evaluate. And remember, from my point of view, never do we think it's adequate to talk about PaO2 or SaO2. We always need to look at the comparative relationship of gas given to gas that we actually get in the arterial blood. Gas given is the FiO2, gas received in the arterial blood is PaO2. So remember, that's called the PF ratio, the PaO2 to FiO2 ratio, also just P to F. That, lots of different ways to say it, but what that actually always is, 
is your patient's PaO2 on the blood gas divided by the FiO2 that you were delivering at that time. So if I come in and my patient's last blood gas was at 4 a.m. and they've made a couple of vent changes to FiO2, I'm not going to use the FiO2 from now to look at that 4 a.m. blood gas. I'm going to use the FiO2 that was applied at the time the 4 a.m. blood gas was drawn. Now, lots of different folks have given up given us lots of different values. And when it really started to become relevant, not, not when it was first developed, but when it really started to become a common discussion was uh, af after publication of the ARDSnet protocols. So first ARDSnet talked about PF ratio and FiO2. The problem is that rarely, rarely do we ever see patients intubated on ventilator who don't have any PEEP. So uh, there was a modification of the ARDSnet protocol and that's called the Berlin protocol. It's probably somewhat important for you to know to be able to say, oh, well, I'm gonna find the Berlin protocol. The Berlin protocol says most patients are on five or more of PEEP. So, Taking your patient's PO2, dividing it by their FiO2, and getting a P to F ratio of less than 250 if the patient's on 40% or more FiO2 and five or more PEEP. This is a mild refractory hypoxemia. Now, correlated to a chest X ray, correlated to changes in lung compliance, we will actually then call it ARDS. But I want you to appreciate this isn't just for ARDS. It's just about determining whether the patient has refractory hypoxemia. So if you're on 60% FiO2 and A to P, and your P to F ratio is less than 250, first of all, turning up the FiO2 might make the PO2 better, but it doesn't really improve the outcome. What you have to do is open the lung by applying a mean airway pressure strategy. That means going up on PEEP, using pressure control inverse, using APRV. So the purpose of this value is to tell me how de-recruited my alveoli are and whether or not they respond to PEEP. Okay, so strategically, my PF ratio is around 370. If you intubated me and put me on 100% FiO2, my PO2 would probably be close to 600. I have very healthy lungs. But that's not who we're talking about. We're talking about patients who present with hypercarbia and hypoxia or one or the other, both oftentimes combined. And we're talking about intubation applying FiO2 and applying PEEP in a patient who is not responding. And again, response is not just about the PO2, it's about the P to F ratio. So if you look at this strategy, this ladder, this has been now validated worldwide. First step was ARDSnet, second was the Berlin protocol. And my assumption is in the next two or so years, they're gonna come back with a little bit more of a modification because now almost everybody says eight of PEEP is normal, not five. And so they'll probably make some transition to that as well. But for now, the Berlin protocol says PDF less than 250 on 40% or greater FiO2 and five or greater of PEEP, you have a mild refractory hypoxemia. And in conjunction with the chest X-ray and lung compliance measures, this could be entitled mild ARDS. PF less than 150 on greater than 40% FiO2 and greater than five of PEEP is going to be a moderate respiratory dysfunction, moderate refractory hypoxemia. And in conjunction with a chest X-ray and measures of lung compliance, et cetera, that could be called moderate ARDS. So if the patient doesn't have ARDS, they still have respiratory failure. You just have to use more tools to say that it's ARDS other than just the P to F ratio. And then this is the really sick patient, right? The patient with a PO2 of less than 100 on 40% or greater FiO2 with five or greater of PEEP, that's gonna be a severe ARDS patient. So I'm just gonna tell you that once you enter into a category with your P to F ratio, that you're on 40% or greater FiO2 and five of PEEP, your basic standard therapy, 
and the PWF is less than 250, these patients are refractory to oxygen. If you really want to help them, you've got to use strategies to open the lung. Strategies to open the lung, remember, are mean airway pressure strategies, P pressure control in first, uh, APRV, high frequency oscillation, and something else that's going to be really important. And that is aggressive and profound position change. That's what you're in charge of, that aggressive, profound position change. The worse the patient is, the more likely it is that they're going to be a responder to prone positioning. Now, not all patients with lung dysfunction will respond to prone positioning, but you'll know that pretty quickly. You put a patient from supine to prone, typically their PO2, without big change in the ventilator, their PO2 will go up. If their PO2 goes up when you prone them, they're a prone responder. If their PO2 doesn't improve at all when you prone them, they're not a prone responder. So generally, we're going to keep them in the prone position for a number of hours, 8, 10, 12, 16. And if they have not improved in that first 24 hours, we're going to say that they are not a prone responder. And there's a fair amount of patients who don't really respond to position therapy. So again, when we have low P to Fs on 40% or greater FiO2 and greater than 5 of PEEP, we're going to think about adding more PEEP or another airway strategy. And we're going to think about prone position, or if we're not able to do prone, at very steep lateral turns. We've got to get that patient off his back. We've got to turn him laterally steeply. And in the best situation, patient will be supine. Okay, so let's see what we know. Here's a patient with a PO2 of 81. His FiO2 is 70%. We're not even looking at PEEP right now. Uh, is he oxygenated or refractory? Well, you might've been okay with his PO2 of 81, but his P to F is 115. Okay, so that's really, really concerning to us. That actually tells us that our patient is refractory. Oxygen is not necessarily benefiting him. He has a higher PO2 perhaps than when you started, but he's not really responding to PO2 because he has a refractory disorder which means the gas you're giving the patient is not reaching the alveoli or it's not getting into the blood. Second patient, PO2 is 120. Oh, you are so ecstatic. That's a great PO2, but he's on an FiO2 of 100%. Okay, so his P to F is 120. Now his PO2 looks great. You're thinking he is fantastic, but this patient is also refractory. So the thing that's important to remember is refractory hypoxemia doesn't mean that when you apply oxygen, the PO2 doesn't improve. What you're trying to do is improve the ratio. You want to improve the ratio. So if the ratio is poor and you increase oxygen, PO2 will go up, but the ratio won't improve that ratio will stay constant, which says you're blowing a lot of oxygen to that patient's lung, but what you really need is a mean airway pressure strategy uh, position. Then we look at this last patient, PO2 is 65. That's the worst PO2 you saw, and his FiO2 is 0.21, but his P to F is 309. So what does that tell me? He is very responsive to oxygen. I want to get his PO2 up, I just need to bump up his oxygen to 30% or 40%. He's going to have a great ratio and his PO2 will continue to go up because the gas I'm giving him is getting into his blood. Now, this seems so extraordinarily straightforward to me. For patient number one, who is refractory, you've got to increase his PEEP or use other mean airway pressure strategies. You can blow all that oxygen at him and feel pretty good about his PO2 of 81, but you are not opening his lung. You are not providing optimal ventilation. We go to the second patient. We say, okay, he's also refractory and he's quite refractory. Same thing. You're blowing a lot of oxygen into his lungs. Some of it is getting into the blood not anywhere near what you expected. It's 100% FiO2. His PO2 should be about 370 or greater, right? Half of what you blow should be in the lung. 
He needs PEEP and other mean airway pressure strategies. And that needs to happen sooner rather than later. We don't sit around and say, let's wait and see if they're gonna get better when we're blowing more oxygen. No, they're gonna get better right away when you're blowing more oxygen, unless the oxygen you're blowing is not reaching the gas exchanging unit of the lung. So this patient is oxygenated. So really all I need to do is if I'm worried about that PO2 is I'm gonna bump up his oxygen. Now you might've said, well, gee, Barbara, that's of course that was straightforward because the patient was on an FiO2 of 21%. Well, let's say he was on 40% and his PO2 was somewhere around 100 on 40%. You would still then say this patient is oxygen responsive, right? It's really about the ratio. The ratio says, should you just blow oxygen or should you open the lung? And if we want to understand how to talk about blood gases, this is first and foremost. And by the way, we're pretty much done with oxygenation. Now we want to talk about CO2. So I've, I've changed the terminology just a little to say, to actually remove carbon dioxide, your lung must be open. You must have clear airways. Your alveoli must have time to recoil. That's called exhale time. And you should pay a lot of attention to that because a lot of times when you're using a rapid respiratory rate, trying to treat CO2, you've reduced the exhale time. And if you reduce exhale time, you're not gonna be able to blow off CO2. Now, something I really like to talk about, again, beyond what we're doing here today, is I really like to talk about end tidal CO2, the value of end tidal CO2, the meaning of end tidal CO2, and how that is applied when we talk about circumstance and situation, uh, particularly as it rates, relates not only to ventilation, but to our blood flow dynamics, because carbon dioxide is a gas that is made as the tissues metabolize. And, and actually CO2 is not a gas that's made. Hydrogen ion is made when the tissues metabolize and hydrogen binds to bicarb and is carried to the lung where it's exhaled as CO2. A little bit beyond where we wanna to be today, all we're gonna talk about today is opening the lung, recoiling the alveoli and exhaling CO2. So that means we're gonna look at tidal volume and we're gonna look at frequency. And that is incredibly and profoundly important. Okay. So ventilation, when we talk about mechanical ventilation, we intubate patients, we place them on a mechanical ventilator. We're thinking about two things. We're thinking about oxygenation and we're thinking about CO2 elimination. So appropriate breathing facilitates the clearance to produce CO2. That's fantastic. And our ventilation is measured by minute ventilation, which is frequency times tidal volume. And it's also really important to remember time for exhalation. So I'm going to go back to the original screen uh, just to capture this and bring that forward so that I can just talk about it a little bit on this slide. And let's just do this. So um, when we're thinking about our ventilation, what we're gonna look at up here is the exhale tidal volume, 560. You can see I've set it at 550, but I'm exhaling a little bit more. And then I'm gonna look at the, uh, I'm sorry, the minute ventilation, which is the frequency, that's F total, the respiratory rate, times the exhale tidal volume, that equals minute ventilation. Now, normal minute ventilation is eight to 10 liters a minute. So you can see this patient's looking pretty good. He's breathing 18 times a minute. He's exhaling 560 cc's tidal volume and his minute ventilation is 10. What's really important though, is to also remember that you want your patient to be able to have time to exhale before his next breath takes place. So time for exhalation is actually, first of all, looked at here in the I to E ratio. But what I want you to look at is this, this V with a dot over it, that's called the flow curve and flow gas goes in and then it stops and then it goes out. 
And before the next breath, which is the green sign here or red, when the patient takes a breath, anything above the baseline is air going into the lung. Anything below the baseline is air coming out of the lung. Before the patient takes his next, next breath, he should always have completed his exhalation. If he has not completed his exhalation, he's trapped with what I would call dirty gas, meaning CO2 rich gas in the lung. This is incredibly and profoundly important because when you have a patient who has high carbon dioxide, the original or the initial response will always be, let's increase his minute ventilation either by increasing his tidal volume or his respiratory rate or both. But as you do that, you decrease the time for exhalation and you may trap CO2 rich gas in the lung. So our purpose in relationship to the blood gas, looking at our patient's CO2 is we're gonna look at respiratory rate, exhale tidal volume, minute ventilation, and did the gas the patient exhale get empty before the next breath began? Okay, that's really straightforward. It's so straightforward. You've got to empty your lung before you get your next breath. And in order for you to empty your lung, you must have appropriate time for exhalation. So very generically, respiratory rate and tidal volume and minute ventilation affect time for exhalation. But very importantly, uh, something else that is critically important is how fast we're going to give that tidal volume to the patient. If we give the tidal volume slow, they may not have time to exhale. And the rate of delivery of gas is called the flow rate. And that's V with the dot with the max next to it. And normal flow rate is 60 to 80 liters a minute. Now you can see this patient has a very low flow rate. The reason people put you on a low flow rate is very straightforward. So I'm, I know you can see me, so I just want to remind you. Flow rate is how fast I deliver the gas into the lung. I'm going to flow that gas into the lung to a target. That target's either pressure or the target is volume. So I push that gas into the lung, the ventilator does, pushes the gas into the lung to that target, volume or pressure, okay? If the lung is non-compliant, I can't push gas in fast. I have to push it slow. If I push the gas slow, the inspiratory time will prolong and the exhalatory time will shorten. Now, if your lung is non-compliant, I have to push gas in slow and I'm gonna push it to a pressure target because I, your lung is not stretchy and I'm gonna damage you if I push that gas in too rapidly. So it is really important to remember that the trade-off of protecting a de-recruited lung with a target of pressure over a prolonged time is that I may not get to exhale all my gas before the next breath begins. And this is the fine line that we walk when we're talking about manipulating our ventilator in relationship to our blood gases. Okay. So for CO2 removal, there are many factors, right? Remember blood flow is one of them. We're not talking about that today, but for CO2 removal from the ventilator, respiratory rate, also known as F frequency, breaths per minute, Tidal volume, the amount of gas not just delivered, but the amount of gas that is exhaled with each breath, if my target is volume. And usually we're gonna set that targeted volume at six to eight mLs per kg predicted body weight, which is all about your gender and your height and really has nothing to do with your weight. And that's per the ARTSNET protocol. And we chart it as VT or tidal volume. And it's uh, for this patient, I'm just saying it's about 375 mLs per breath. But the real deal, what we really care about is minute ventilation. That's the real deal. That's frequency times tidal volume and normally moving around eight to 10 liters a minute. Patients who are hyperventilating are moving 12, 13, 14, 15 liters a minute. So if you're moving a high minute ventilation and you're still retaining CO2, our purpose then is to look at whether or not you're actually 
exhaling your gas completely. Because if you're breathing that fast, you have one or two problems. You have bad blood flow, which is often the problem, or you don't have time to exhale. It's so straightforward. Know what to expect. And if it's not happening, consider what the problems are. We shouldn't just react by increasing the respiratory rate or the tidal volume. We need to look at the patient and say, do you actually have blood flow past your alveoli? And are you actually being allowed time for exhalation? So last but certainly not least is the production of metabolic acid. And always important to remember that cells produce acid. Cells produce acid on metabolism and respiration, which are both metabolic events. The cell produces hydrogen ion. Hydrogen ion is carried as bicarbonate or as carbonic acid, H2CO3. And we measure a calculation of carbon dioxide. And that carbon dioxide is going to be regulated by the lung. The major acid uh, hydrogen will be regulated by the kidney and regulated by the cell. But carbon dioxide is regulated by the lung alone. So my kidney may be in failure, which means I'm going to have an excess of hydrogen ion. My cells are hypermetabolic, and that means I'm going to have an excess of hydrogen ion. Those are going to be really metabolic events. But we're going to remind ourselves that the lung is a very facile organ and can adapt its rate and depth of breath depending on the presence of acid. So if we just remind ourselves about the normal values of our blood gas, we're gonna, this is really a range of blood gas. I like to look at perfect. I'm going to remind you that the range 7.35 to 7.45, perfect is 7.4. CO2 range 35 to 45 millimeters of mercury, perfect is 40. PO2 72 to 104 millimeters of mercury. It could be a little less or a little more depending on your age. And the, the perfect is going to be around 90. Bicarb 22 to 30, perfect 24. Arterial sats in a percent of hemoglobin saturated, 95 to 100. There's not perfect is 100, obviously. And then uh, we'll look at the anion gap in the bicarb at a little bit on the change in bicarb at a little bit more uh, in depth next week. Oh, okay, so I'm gonna come back now to when we're looking at the blood gas. The first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna evaluate your oxygenation. We're gonna look at P to F ratio. We're gonna make recommendations about whether or not the gas I'm giving the patient's getting into the blood. Is there blood flow by and are the alveoli recruited? Done. Second thing on our blood gas, we're gonna look at that pH. pH is gonna tell us of a symptom, that symptom being alkalosis or acidosis. And any deviation from perfect pH tells us about addition of acid or removal of acid. If the pH is up, more acid's been removed. If the pH is down, more acid's been put into situation. And we're gonna think about the two things we measure on a blood gas. We measure CO2 as a direct indicator of acid, and we measure base as a indirect reciprocal of acid. So how I want you to think about this is you look at the base or the bicarb, but you always think hydrogen. If base is down, hydrogen is up. If base is up, hydrogen is down. What you care about is the hydrogen. You don't really care about the base but you're measuring the base. So we're looking at these three components that we evaluate on our blood gas, three seen components, the base, the pH, and the CO2. And we understand the unseen component, which is the metabolic acid, hydrogen. Okay, so 
Remember the questions you're asking at the bedside about mechanical ventilation. Now we're gonna to correlate to the rules of ABG interpretation after oxygenation. So I did your P to F, I have a pretty good idea about whether or not you're oxygenating. And now I'm gonna look at the three basic rules. The first rule being, you gotta know the pH. pH just is the symptom of whatever the primary disorder is, more or less acid into the blood. Number two, you must know the PaCO2 and the base, whether it's an excess or deficit. And number three, we're going to validate some of that with the anion gap. Okay, so first and foremost, in ABG interpretation, you look first at the pH. Perfect pH is what you're always going to look for. Is the pH perfect? Yes or no. And then you look for, is it in range? If the pH is in range, this may just be a normal variation, a little extra acid, a little less acid but it can only be considered normal if both the base and the PaCO2 are in the range. If one or the other or both are out of range, you can either have a primary causative or a causative and compensatory problem. So I, I'm, I'm sorry, I feel like that might've been a little confusing. I wanna make sure that you remember you look at that pH, and if the pH is not perfect, if it's down 7.36, you either have a problem with compensation or you just have a normal variation, okay? That's it. It's so straightforward. Now, if you have a pH that is outside of range, that's always a problem. That's, that's not confusing for folks. The, pro, the confusing for folks is when you're in the range of normal with your pH, but you have a problem. You have a problem, you've got to name the problem, but if your pH is in the range of normal, you also will have compensation. And it always has to be the system that did not cause the problem that is providing the compensation. So. Going to think about the acid base experience, pH perfect 7.4, CO2 perfect 40, bicarb perfect 24, and that's also going to be your base perfect is zero, right? Because base is negative two to positive two. The range of CO2, green reflecting alkaline, red reflecting acid, less CO2 means you're more alkaline, more CO2 means you're more acid. pH, lower pH is acid, higher pH is alkaline and bicarb. Lower bicarb means more hydrogen ion, that's acid. And a higher bicarb means less hydrogen ion, that's gonna be more alkaline, okay. So now we're gonna look at that PCO2. Remember perfect is 40, range 35 to 45. Below 35, your CO2 is always alkalotic. Above 45, it's always acidotic. Now, if you have a PCO2 of 50, acidotic, and a pH of 7.34, acidotic, you already know your problem. It's causative because you had more CO2 making your pH acid, okay? Very, very important for us to appreciate that. So now we're gonna look at it. Here's your CO2 at 65, that's on the acid side. Your pH is 7.25, that's on the acid side. This is respiratory acidosis. Now you may have some other problems because we're only looking at half of our measures here, just looking at CO2 and pH. So as CO2 goes up, your pH goes down. CO2 is up, pH is down, you have respiratory acid. You have a respiratory acidosis, okay? Now we're gonna go and look at our base and you can use bicarb and we're gonna just talk about base and bicarb. I'm gonna mention them both, okay? So if I talk about bicarb, perfect bicarb is 24. Talk about base, perfect base is zero. Bicarb range really 22 to 26 and base range negative two, meaning the absence of buffer, negative two or the addition of buffer, positive two, okay? So greater than positive two means that your metabolic acid is down. Greater than 26 means your metabolic acid is down. That's always alkalotic. And more negative than negative two or more negative or lower than 22, that's always acidotic. Again, 
You have to look at causative or compensatory. So first and foremost, we are only looking at causative, okay? So my bicarb is down, my base is negative eight. That means my hydrogen ion is up. When base is negative, when bicarb is down, hydrogen ion is always up. Hydrogen ion is acid, hydrogen ion is up, pH is down, that's a metabolic acidosis, a metabolic acidosis. So really, really important to look at this relationship. Now, if you have memorized something like Rome or you're using other things like that, that's fine. I think it's really important to understand the reflection of the acid. And this is where people get a little bit messed up because they're thinking, well, if I have metabolic acidosis, I ought to be putting more base into the blood to neutralize the acid. And you know what? That's fantastic. But you know what? Base is an acid that's missing a hydrogen. So when base is in the circulation, it actually will bind to the hydrogen, which then makes it carbonic acid. So it's no longer base once it accepts the hydrogen ion. So you have to actually remind yourself that base is in the blood with one purpose, to neutralize the metabolic acid hydrogen. But when base marries hydrogen, it becomes something else. It's no longer a base anymore. It is no longer a base. So when base is in deficit or bicarb is down, metabolic acid, is always in excess. So now we look at this issue. Our acid, hydrogen ion, is up. Our base is down and our pH is down. This is metabolic acidosis. And when you look at that base, you say, well, the base is down, the pH is down. How do I get my head around the fact that base is down, acid is up, pH has gone down? Okay, pH is what they call a negative logarithm from the metabolic acid. You know how I interpret that? I'm a simple girl, opposite. So when metabolic acid is up, pH is down. When carbon dioxide is up, pH is down. It's the opposite of the presence. When acids are up, pH is down. When acids are down, pH is up. It's so important for us to look at the acids, not necessarily the base. Okay. So respiratory acidosis, pH down, CO2 up. Respiratory alkalosis, PCO2 down, pH is up. Metabolic acidosis, pH is down. Bicarb is down because acid is up in metabolic acidosis. And in metabolic alkalosis, pH is up and bicarb is up. We're not looking at CO2. We're not talking about compensation or anything else until now. We have a metabolic compensation for respiratory acidosis that requires that your kidney has the ability to eliminate hydrogen ion so it accepts carbonic acid, H2CO3, separates them and excretes the hydrogen and maintains the HCO3, which is bicarb. So the bicarb levels go up. The kidney is working. It excretes the hydrogen, retains the bicarb. The bicarb levels rise, making the base in excess because the kidney excreted acid and conjugated buffer but you gotta have a functional kidney in order for this to happen. So CO2 is up, the kidney is excreting hydrogen and recruiting bicarb. As the bicarb goes up, the pH comes back up to normal. That's respiratory acid compensation. Metabolic compensation for respiratory acidosis, as we just said, you must have renal function and that takes time. So now let's just take a look at that very first gas we looked at, CO2 of 65 pH. Now, remember earlier it was like 7.28. Now it's 7.36. It's not perfect, but it is in the range of normal. But I have a high presence of acid 
which means that my pH is on the acid side of perfect, even though it's normal. So I have a respiratory acidosis with the normal pH. That always means if your pH is normal, in the range of normal, not perfect, because it won't get perfect, but in the range of normal, that always means compensation. So I know what that means. And I say, now I'm going to look at the bicarb and I know that the bicarb is going to be up, that the base is going to be ex in excess. And I know that means the metabolic free acid, the fixed acid known as the hydrogen, that's going to be down. So bicarb up, base in excess, increased buffer, excreted hydrogen. I've got a good kidney and I have now compensated for respiratory acidosis. You would never ever say metabolic alkalosis and respiratory acidosis. That does not make any sense at all. We should never say that. We need to figure out what the problem is and problem is always defined by the direction of the pH. Remember the pH can be in the range of normal but you still have a problem. And you only know that by looking at your CO2 and your bicarb. Your CO2 is up, as is your bicarb, which means your metabolic acid is down. CO2 as an acid is up, metabolic acid H plus is down. And I know that because the bicarb is up. So now I just take a quick look at this, uh, looking at this situation, okay? This is compensation to metabolic acid. So hydrogen ion went up, 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 up. And remember it binds to the base, taking the base out of circulation. So base is in deficit, bicarb is reduced. And sorry, the pH really should have been down, but that's the problem. But we actually have a compensation because now what, what's really happened is that we're presenting that H2CO3 to the lung and it's separating into water and CO2, and the lung is excreting the CO2 through rapid ventilation. And that's what's bringing the pH back to normal. So when I always say the most obvious form of failure, when you come to the bedside and you see a patient who is breathing rapidly, assume that that is compensatory for metabolic acidosis until proven otherwise. That means you don't let patients breathe 26, 28, 30 times a minute for four, six, eight hours without asking for and evaluating an arterial blood gas because persistent hyperventilation or persistent tachypnea is the most organized sign that you have a patient who is in distress. They may not look like they're distressed. They may not behave like they're distressed, but your assumption has to be that if they're blowing off CO2, they're doing that in general until proven otherwise to compensate for metabolic acidosis. And the only way you know that is via the blood gas. Okay. So I just have a couple of little slides here. I'm going to skip over them because I think we've covered this part really well. And I'm just going to come back to always remembering that when you look at the blood gas, you've got to name that problem. So first you name the direction of the pH shift, perfect, up or down, inside, outside range. Okay, that's step two. Number three, you look for what caused the variation of the pH. So remember, even if it's just down from perfect, you're looking at what caused the variation of the pH. And then step four, is their compensation. So basically, pH, perfect up or down, inside, outside range. Are we putting more or less acid in the blood from breathing or more or less acid in the blood from metabolics? And is there an opposite compensatory mechanism? So let's look at what you think here, okay? So first, your pH is 7.455. Okay, so that is not perfect. It is up, it's outside of range and therefore alkalotic. Okay, then you look over at your CO2. Your CO2 is 26. It is not perfect, which is 40. It is down, but it is also outside of range. So you have, you're blowing off that acid, you're blowing off CO2. So you have a respiratory alkalosis, okay?
Then we're gonna go over here and look at our bicarb and our bicarb is 29. That means it is also up and outside of range, which means metabolic acid is down and our base is in excess. So we don't just have one problem, we've got two. Mixed respiratory and metabolic alkalosis causing an alkalotic pH. Now, remember the PO2 is 80, but I don't really know what that means because I don't have an FiO2 here. But if I said that the FiO2 was 0.5, that would mean that we were somewhere around 160 P to F ratio. So on 50% FiO2, I'm not having very good gas exchange. I'm gonna consider P for some other methodology. Now, the very first thing I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna talk to my respiratory therapist. Why is my patient breathing off his CO2? Is he attempting to oxygenate? Should I put him on some PEEP, improve his oxygenation, slow down his breathing? And then I've got to look over here and see what's been happening on this side. And was the patient having severe diarrhea or, uh, or are we over diuresing the patient? A lot of things cause metabolic alkalosis. But from a ventilator perspective, I don't want my patient breathing this fast. I need for him to breathe slower. So I have to figure out, is he breathing this fast and blowing off CO2 because he's attempting to oxygenate? If that's true, let me help him be more oxygenated by giving him some PEEP, okay? Trying to control his respiratory rate so that his CO2 starts to rise and his pH comes back down. Okay, so now we look at the next one, pH 7.25. pH 7.25, that's an acidotic pH. The pH is down and outside of range. Then I go over to PaCO2 and I see in my PaCO2 that my PCO2 is not perfect and it is up and it's outside range. So that's a high degree of CO2 respiratory acid with a pH that's acidotic, but that's not the end. I still have to look more. I look over here at his bicarb. His bicarb is 15. So that is not perfect and it's down and it's outside of range. And that means that his metabolic acid is up. Same with the base deficit, down and outside of range, metabolic acid is up. Metabolic acid's up, CO2 is up. I have a mixed metabolic and respiratory acidosis. Pretty straightforward. Okay, I go to the next one. The pH is 7.36, which is not perfect, and it's down, but it's inside range. That can only be one of two things. A normal variation, which means then nothing can be out of the ordinary, or I have an abnormality with compensation. So my pH is not perfect. It is down, but it's inside range. So my first step is to look at CO2. Uh-oh, CO2 is not perfect. It's up and it's outside range. CO2 is up, pH is down. I have respiratory acidosis. But the only way that my pH can be normal in this respiratory acidosis state is if there's compensation. So let's go look for the compensation. Ha ha. Bicarb is 34, that means metabolic acid is down. I'm excreting metabolic acid from the kidney or somebody gave me a couple amps of bicarb, I don't know. And my base is in excess. So bicarb is up, base is in excess, metabolic acid is down. I made room for the fact that there's more respiratory acid by excreting the metabolic acid. And that's what gave me a normal pH in the face of respiratory acidosis. And I go over here, my last blood gas, I'm looking at 7.38, and that 7.38 uh, is down, not perfect, down and inside range. CO2, so I know that it's either an abnormality with compensation or just a normal variation. I look over here and the CO2 is 28. That means I'm blowing off a lot of acid. Uh-oh, that's telling me I definitely have a problem and the problem is not respiratory because I'm blowing off acid. I go over here at the bicarb, the bicarb's 12 and the base deficit's negative 13. That means metabolic acid is up. 
Metabolic acid is up, pH is down, and I'm blowing off CO2 to bring the pH back within the range of normal. I have metabolic acidosis, but it's compensated. So when your pH is out of range, no matter what attempts there are, if the pH is out of range, it's uncompensated. It's also considered acute. When the pH is in range and you absolutely have a definitive problem, when your pH is in range, what that means is that you have compensation or just normal variation. And that's up to you to discover because quite honestly, what we might end up doing for patient number three is we might try to blow off some CO2, but we're not gonna do it quickly because if we, let's say he's breathing at a rate of 12, I might wanna increase him to a rate of 15, but I'm gonna be really cautious because I don't wanna blow off his CO2 and transition him into metabolic alkalosis. This is gonna take time. That bicarb will take time to return to normal. So I'm gonna be a little bit cautious. My doc might say, yeah, I'm gonna blow off a little bit more CO2 because I wanna make more room for oxygenation. Patient's not well oxygenated. I'm gonna increase the respiratory rate by two today, and then I'll do it again tomorrow. And as I do change it by two today, this might drop down to about 52. And by tomorrow, my bicarb may have dropped down to 30 or 29. And then I'll increase my respiratory rate two more times and expect by the next day, bicarbon base will be back to normal. I'll have blown off CO2 and my pH will be back to, will be basically at the same basic level it is right now, around 7.36 to 7.40. Because bicarb and base are reflecting more of the metabolic component. We're not gonna talk about those today. We're gonna to talk about those next week as we enrich our experience in understanding metabolic, particularly metabolic acidosis, metabolic alkalosis on top of metabolic acidosis that will require an anion gap. And we'll look at what it is we can do to try to improve on that metabolic component of our blood gas. But in the final, what I definitely want to remind you of and say is you have to remember what you're doing with your ventilator. When you are trying to fix oxygenation, you're gonna look at whether or not FiO2 improves your ratio. If the ratio, P to F ratio, doesn't improve, you've got to consider mean airway pressure strategies. With ventilation, we're going to look at minute ventilation, respiratory rate times tidal volume, and time to exhale. And we're going to really evaluate our therapeutic interventions, the way we're ventilating patients, the target, the mode, the variables oxygenation, FiO2 and mean airway pressure, ventilation, minute ventilation, respiratory rate times tidal volume, and time to exhale. And we're never going to forget that we really cannot fix metabolics with the ventilator. We have to consider that is a blood flow dynamic, a kidney dynamic, an ion or electrolyte dynamic. We can't fix that with ventilation. So we're going to come back next week. We're going to look at around 20 case studies after we talk about metabolics and we talk about the anion gap and what we call the delta gap uh, when we, we're trying to evaluate the uh, basically the metabolic alkalosis with metabolic acidosis state that can occur, particularly with overdiuresis or with nausea and uh, with vomiting. And we're just gonna take a really good look at how we can actually communicate effectively about ventilatory mechanics and our patient's arterial blood gas in order to improve outcomes for our patients. Because of course, that's what we wanna do every day is improve outcomes for our patients. I thank you so very much for your attention. I'm actually gonna stop my recording now and
open up for any questions. And thank you again. I'll see you next week for part two of mechanical ventilation, metabolics, and blood.